Uh, as an EMT, you're able to deliver medication, okay? There's a short list, so you don't have a lot to memorize. You do always, even as a nurse or doctor, whatever you're going into, pharmacology is going to be one of your major things, okay? Like in nursing, how many guys took nursing? Okay, 100%. It's the, the, a lot of nursing programs on your pharmacology test, 100% is the passing score. So that's something that you have to look at. You can't make, you can't really make mistakes with this medicine, okay? You, you have to be familiar with the medicine. When I trained other paramedics, the first thing we would do is sit in the back of the box. I'd open up the drug box. I'd pull one drug out at a time and have that person tell me everything that they knew about that medication. And if they didn't know the information that I expected them to know, I'd write it down so you can't get that medication until you study. If we get to a certain point where they're really poor in pharmacology, they wouldn't give any medication. So it's, it's, it is very important. You'll see in a minute, I, I, I Google up some numbers, okay? Anyway, uh, used to, the old format was that you had to have medical control for everything, okay? Now I believe the tests are shifting to where uh, everything is a standing order. These drugs, these medications are gonna be a standing order, okay? So we'll talk about that in a minute. Pharmacology, obviously the study of medication, okay? And you take medication to prevent sickness, all right? Pain, whatever else that might be. And these are just, the EMT side medications are pretty common. They all have side effects, all right. Any, every medication that you have had a side effect to it, some of them have a long list of it. Sometimes we use the side effects as far as the actual function of the medication. Okay, so like not EMT wise, but nitroglycerin, uh, first line medication for hypertension, that, that symptomatic hypertension, if you add that in there, if I give them a nitro. Subliminal nitro. Why? Why the nitro? Because it dilates the blood vessels. Which is going to do what to the blood pressure? Lower the blood pressure. Increase the blood pressure, right? So, person that's symptomatic hypertensive, give them nitro. It's always going to lower their blood pressure. Right? So we give them nitro to lower their blood pressure, right? That's not the. That's not really the design of the drug. It's just a side effect of the drug. But we use the side effect. Uh, to, to get to the point where we want to, uh, what am I talking about? We use the side effect for the uh, indication, right? Okay. So here's, I read this on Twitter the other day, and I looked it up. Uh, 400,000 deaths a year for medical error, right? Drug, medication error. I should have put medication error in there, right? 400,000 deaths per year. The emergency department is the third most common for making medication errors, okay? So some medications that you give uh, is might be a math error. You give too much, okay, which can kill the patient or you, you don't give enough and it won't do anything to the patient. I don't really remember the medic. I'm trying to remember the medication but it doesn't matter. Is the the dose of the medication? Oh. If you miss the decimal point, so let's say this is milligrams, okay? You fix them, you kill them. <laughs> okay? moving the decimal point too much, you give too much medication, all right? So it is important to make sure that we look, you, we'll go through these, these, step, these step processes in, in medication administration, so it is important that you give the right dose of medication. You know, you don't give a medication that you don't know the side effects, so there's no surprise. It's like a lawyer asking a question. They already know the answer. They just asking the question. So you, you don't give that medication without knowing what it's going to do. 
there's no surprises. You know what the medication is supposed to do and it's going to do, okay? So uh, there's the thing about, you know, the patient giving, taking their own medication, like nitro. A lot of times the nitro is expired or it's been out in the sun or it's had too much movement. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that later. So we give our own medication and most of it is protocol driven. Uh, as you see in the, on a, like a test question, there are going to be standing orders and it's going to be within your protocol to give these medications, all right, that we're going to talk about. So oxygen, any questions with oxygen? Been, you've been around familiar with oxygen long enough. Hypoxia, hypoxemia, dysmia, increased work of breathing, okay? So we look at this. This has changed over the past decade or so. Uh, before 2010, we give oxygen to everybody. Everybody got oxygen. Here, can't hurt you. American Heart Association, which sets the standards for emergency care, emergency cardiac care, okay, says that if you give oxygen to a patient that has a... Uh, SpO2 greater than 95, 94%, has no work of breathing, no dysmia, and you're just giving them oxygen to give it to them, you're actually causing harm to that patient. So uh, a heart attack patient, a trauma patient, a stroke patient, you're, you're causing harm to them. Creating this environment, which is, some doctors will say it's theory, some believe it, some don't, that's why the slow change in it, okay? But they're saying you create these free radical ions that actually damages the cell, damages the heart, or increases the, the infarction site, whether it be in the brain or the heart, and it's damaging to trauma as well. They have a lot of data out on that, but we don't give oxygen. We would give oxygen if the SpO2 is less than 94%. The patient has dys dysmia, difficulty breathing, or they have an increased work in breathing. And we'll break those down when we get into the respiratory chapter, okay, what that looks like. Dysmia and increased work of breathing is two different things. So we'll take a look. So we're gonna provide oxygen to the patient. Should be no, no problem there. We know how to identify it as medical grade oxygen, right? It says it on the label, USP. U.S. Pharmacopeia. So it's medical grade oxygen, it's green and silver, or completely green, has the two pin index, right? So we can identify the medication. There, just like we talked about, there's some, some precautions, high concentration of oxygen uh, can reduce coronary artery blood flow. So the blood flow to the coronary artery. We don't wanna do that, right? Uh, and then this radical, free radical, uh, production. Maybe we'll talk about that later. Not a huge point. Just remember the, the criteria for oxygen, administ oxygen administration. Okay. In the same in trauma, uh, this is 95% okay, for trauma patients. But uh, it used to be that everybody, every cut that out uh, almost a decade ago. So we don't really do that anymore. Everybody good on oxygen? Okay. Glucose, we need glucose all the time for pro proper function of the cell. We need oxygen and glucose, correct? Uh, patients who have di diabetes, they may be just hypoglycemic, okay? They need glucose. So uh, this is mainly the oral glucose is mainly to give the diabetic patients. We do a D-stick. We check their D-stick, they have a low D-stick, then we can give them oral glucose. I meant to go by and get another tube the other day, but this one's getting heated. Did y'all take this last year? No. No? Uh, yeah, it's just, you can actually get this in a form of this in uh, Walmart. I almost bought one the other day, but it's like 50 bucks, so I was like, mm, no. Uh, anyhow, it's just glucose paste. When we talk about the medications, okay, and it's on the slide too in a few minutes, you need the indication, contraindication, dose, route, and side effects. You need to know that about all the medications that we're gonna talk about. 
today. All right, so those things there. So, in and I would add in the class of drugs. Okay, when when you guys get into a broader range of pharmacology, remember the classes of drugs. Put them all in the same class. They're easier to remember that way because all the side effects are are the same in all the classes. I'll, I'll bring it up when we talk about albuterol and epinephrine. Okay, so. Uh, oral glucose is a gel comes in when when it's in the tube like this you have to sort of knead it you know like a cat needs to thing you sort of squeeze it because it won't shake it's a gel it's thick and you and you uh, squeeze it up together to get it sort of mixed together okay and then uh, me I let the in order to keep from choking the patient I let them uh, administer it themselves. So I cut the tip off and I let them squirt it in their mouth uh, themselves. I like for it to sit down into the subliminal area, sit, sort of sit down in the jaw a little bit before they swallow it because it will absorb it somewhat and then uh, they swallow it. So it's an oral medication. So it's going to take longer for this to uh, for this uh, hang on The time that it takes for it to, to uh, onset, thank you. The onset of the medication. It's going to be a slower onset because uh, it's oral medication. A pill takes about 20 minutes onset, right? Okay, so uh, it'll take a little bit of time. So, about maybe after 10 minutes or so, I would recheck the deep fit. Okay? So once you administer a medication, you reevaluate what that medication has done all the time. You reevaluate the medication. Okay. So if the medication is working, what would be an indication of that? Uh, the blood glucose goes up. What? Blood glucose goes up. Maybe mental status goes up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the indication is a low dextra blood glucose level, D stick, low D stick. Okay. Uh, in any any patient, doesn't necessarily have to be a diabetic. You can have a, uh, you could be hypoglycemic. I would be hypoglycemic if I had to wait till almost two o'clock to eat. I'd pass out, you know. But uh, what's that like? Fourth one? Mm -hmm. I'd have to I'd have to eat before then. Okay, but uh, so. Indication, low low blood sugar. Right. Contra, contra indication. Anybody that has an altered mental status or obviously is unconscious can't take an oral medicine. So you never administer an oral medicine to someone with an altered mental status. Uh, an altered mental status to the point where you didn't think that they could swallow the medication. Okay. Or the patient being unconscious. Okay? So we're good. So that's a contraindication of it. There's no really negative side effects. You could take this right now and take a whole tube of oral glucose and uh, get, you'd get like a little sugar rush. Okay? Great. I'll probably get the black pill. Yeah. You know, stay awake. What, where's Walmart at? You know? No, no. Go, go buy the nicotine or the caffeine gum. Two cases of like a cup of coffee, but the uh, anyway. So the class of drug is a carbohydrate. Go figure, right? Just a little little liquid pizza in there, but it breaks down very easy. It's already in a in a form that it doesn't have to be broken down. So uh, and it's administered the route is oral. So what I would do is I'd cut the tip off, let the patient self-administer. If they can't hold the tube, then they're too altered for me to give this medication to. All right? So I wouldn't give them an oral medication, or if they're unconscious. Can you reduce the same tube for other patients? No, no, never reduce the same, same tube. One, one tube, one patient. Yeah. So the, uh, it does work well. I've given it several times. To, to patients who are, are, who are hypoglycemic, 
but they're still conscious. They're just some a little altered, but they're still conscious. They have a low blood sugar. Uh, what about an unconscious patient? What would you do with an unconscious patient? Not give them this, right? <laughs> well, what would you do? You have a, you go out, possible diabetic emergency, you have a patient, you go out there, you do a D stick and it's 30. They're unconscious, unresponsive. Oh. Hmm? I, I would assume you would. That's, uh, well, you're a, you're an EMT, and that would be outside of your scope of practice. Okay. As you can see. You'd call for ALS. Oh. You need a paramedic unit. Because what they would do is they'd come out there and start an IV, and then the dextrose. 50%, it's 50% dextrose and 50% water, okay? So they start an IV and they push this in a, a rather large IV, you know, like 18, 20 gauge, okay, and 20 something big, but they, an 18, it has to go in a pretty big IV because it's really thick, okay? It's sugar water, all right? And so uh, they push it IV and in about because it's IV, so it's a very fast onset. I would say within a minute or two, they would be fully conscious and alert if it was just a problem with hypoglycemia. They'll go from a Glasgow of potentially like four or five, okay, to a Glasgow of 15 in just a couple minutes. So they look, they look dead, you're shooting full of glucose and they pop up or look at you and go, oh, I forgot to take my medicine or I ate too much or something like that, right? So uh, if the patient's unconscious, then they need ALS. So start an IV, give them D50. Otherwise, it's pretty common use. Like I said, you can buy it at, Gluco, uh, buy it at Walmart. It's just, they, it's just these little gel candy packets, what it looks like, right? It's just full of, <coughs> full of glucose. Right? You'd never give anybody anything by mouth if they're unconscious. So nothing, if they're unconscious, NCO, nothing by mouth. Right? Uh, even even uh, any, any type of oral medication. Everybody good with glucose, oral glucose? And it's a, the form of it is a, is a gel. What's the form of oxygen? Oxygen. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is a gel. Yeah. You can tell it's Friday. You had to think about that one, right? Okay. Activated charcoal. What a drug. Activated charcoal is, is given. This is one form of it. I don't have the other form. I'll pass it around. Be very careful with it. Uh, it stains absolutely everything, and it will not come out of your clothes. Okay. Uh, activated charcoal. The class of drug is an absorbent. It absorbs. It's the indication is for uh, medication overdose, pill form medication overdose. What it does is the patient. Uh, you know, they take a bunch of pills for an overdose, either intentional or accidental, okay? Uh, you, if this was your order to give activated charcoal, you got here? Yep. Yeah, burn. Ain't that dry. Uh, so you give activated charcoal, and what it does is it takes the pill fragments and it binds them together, and it sends it down the GI tract, and they poop it out, okay? In the hospital, this is why I like paramedicine so much, in the hospital, they monitor the patient's uh, output. So they have to poo over this little hat looking thing and they, they look and see if there's any pill fragments in the poo. It turns, it, it turns the poo black, 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 tarry poo, okay? Along with it is 
uh, you have to give a laxative with this. Uh, typically, they give what's called a mad citrate. It looks like it's 7-Up. It's in a little red green bottle. You can actually buy a mad citrate over the counter. And uh, they take it, and it sort of helps pass the charcoal if it causes constipation. All right. I, in 24 years, I've never given activated charcoal. This citron, when we did carry it, it sat on the inlet and it expired and threw it away. We got more, and it sat there and expired and threw it away. Finally, they got wise and just took it out of the protocols, okay? One thing is that it has to be within about 20 or 30 minutes where those pill forms are already dissolved in, in the bloodstream, right? So there's a time limit on it. Plus, one of the side effects of this is vomiting. And I mean projectile vomiting from me to Jews. I mean, we would throw oh, yeah. you know, projectile, okay? In a sense, everything. Absolutely everything. Nothing good about myself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's why, and, and really most, even hospitals are reluctant to use it. They just have different ways to do it now. Uh, one, vomiting, pre-hospital-wise, vomiting is an airway concern. In hospital, vomiting is an airway concern, okay? So, we really don't want the patient to vomit. Now, you have a couple different types. You have the people that always sort of overdose on pills and always do that. They come in and drink this thing like a cocktail because they're so used to it. It's a briquette ground up in water. Charcoal, uh, it got a lot of it. But the, uh, it is nasty. I've taken a little taste of it before, so I can tell you it's nasty. Uh, but uh, anyhow, they end up throwing it up. So in the hospital setting, they put an NG tube in, a nasal gastric tube that goes into the stomach, and they just push it in. And it's, it's in the stomach. They don't even taste it. Okay. But uh, the dose is 25 grams. You give the whole amount. So this is in a liquid form. It's already had the has the water in it. Some of them come in a powder form when you mix the water. Okay. In it, uh, and it's given oral. It's an oral medication on the animals. But we definitely. I don't know really of any EMS agencies anymore that carry it because it just expires most of the time. Uh, one, because you get out there and say, oh yeah, I took these pills five hours ago. It won't help, okay? That, that's medicine's already in, in the system. Okay, so, uh, anyway, activated charcoal. I uh, have given this in the hospital setting before, and it's, it's nasty. Uh, I used to just give an NG tube and give it through the NG tube. Now, I have messed with students before. I, like the patient would be on this end of the, you know, this is the head end here of the, of the bed. And I said, the students would come in, I'd say, hey, why don't y'all stand at the end of the bed and uh, watch this. You get a better seat. You get it through the floor. What's the potential of what they're going to do? They're going to vomit. It's stained. There's going to be a black mark there. Okay. Well, back back in the day, they used it to they they used it a lot actually. But I don't. I used to have paper cuts, but you can you can sort of see down in there that. And if you want to take the little lid, go ahead. <laughs> it's oh, it's charcoal. Not to make fun of that, just right off the bat of your mouth, because I'm not feeling like this just today. It, it's it's
I was looking for something poor little hand. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm really tempted. No, I wouldn't. Okay, good. This is not going to. Yeah. It'll, it'll turn. I wouldn't do that. Okay. Oh, don't. Okay. This is so. Anyhow, a uh, little activated charcoal, it's an absorbent, it absorbs the, the pill fragments, okay, that's ingested. Everybody good with activated charcoal? Now, not only do you have to know the adult dosage, dosage but you also have to know the pediatric dosage, okay? Yeah, I mean, there's a pediatric dose, but they would be really reluctant to give it to the kid. Now, remember, back back in history here, uh, they used to induce vomiting for poison and overdose, right? So things have changed quite a bit. They used to give what's called syrup of epicat, which in, would induce vomiting. Okay, I mean, it was a it was a standard of care, all right, and then. Uh, So it, they would induce vomiting, but now that's not the standard of care anymore. They don't. We don't want to induce vomiting. I'm just gonna take this thing. What are y'all doing now? For for poisons? Yeah. We leave it in the system. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and and counteract the effects oh. of the system. Vomiting is a huge deal as far as airway. Uh, aspiration and things, so they don't. We don't really want to induce vomiting. You don't want your patients vomiting, okay? Isn't that for adults? Like they would be vomiting so much. Yeah. Yeah, but it, for us, it's an airway concern, more of an airway problem. Okay, so aspirin. Aspirin is another medication that you can give. Cardiac related problems, right? We give aspirin for cardiac related chest pain. We suspect someone having an MI. Why do we do that? There you go. It's anticoagulant. It prevents uh, platelet functions interfering with platelet functions, or easily said, it thins the blood and it uh, it prevents clotting. Okay, so we give the patient 325 milligrams of aspirin. That's the dose. The route is oral on the amylus, since we don't have water on there for the patients, uh, we give them baby aspirin. Now the baby aspirin is 81 milligrams. See how well you are with math. The dose is 325 milligrams for aspirin. ASA is the abbreviation, okay? Baby aspirin, which is given on an ambulance most of the time, is 81 milligrams. How many milligrams is that? We'll just divide 325 by 325. Exactly. You get 324 milligrams. Just a side note, if you document, if you give baby aspirin, you document 325 you didn't give 325, you, give, you gave 324 milligrams. You get four baby aspirin, they clear them up, okay? You misdocumented that, okay? They will get on to you for that. Is that my cellulite? No, it, it's better to chew it. And you definitely don't chew, if they give you a whole aspirin, the white ones, you can't, you can't chew those. It's, it's nasty, okay? It'll make you throw up. But, so they give them little orange flavored uh, baby aspirin. 
the, the most common type. They give them four, okay? Oral, and it's given to thin the blood down because in that patient that's having that chest pain, that, that occlusion, okay, we thin that blood down in order for the blood to get by the occlusion, right? The blockage. Make sense? Did I remember that from last year? Yeah. So uh, there's some there's some problems with aspirin. Of course, we always we always ask patients if they're allergic to medication, right? The sample allergies are you allergic? If they already take an asp if they already take aspirin or they take a blood thinner, then you wouldn't give them another blood thinner. That's a protocol issue, really, but you wouldn't necessarily give them. So if they already take aspirin, if they just had a full dose of aspirin that day, then you wouldn't give them another full dose of aspirin. It would thin their blood down too much where they would start bleeding really easy. So if they did have to go into surgery, they would have a risk of, of, of bleeding, excessive bleeding, right? Or if they already take a blood thinner, then you would have to question on whether or not you give them the aspirin. And like I said, that would be a that would be a protocol, more of a protocol issue, but that's sort of outside. Uh, in here, they don't take blood thinners. They're not allergic to aspirin. We would give the aspirin. Okay, makes sense. Okay, yeah. and that's very common. So, and it is very important that uh, you get that on quick. You have them take the aspirin quick. You want that blood to thin. In fact, the, uh, I don't know if it's a commercial or something I read, but anyway, they were saying that people who experience in cardiac-related symptoms should go in the house and take an aspirin before, uh, as they're calling 911, they should take an aspirin. It helps thin that blood. It's, it's not that quick onset, though. I mean, you still have sort of a 30-minute onset with it. Okay, so the... But they, this is something that you want to get, you want to administer the patient uh, relatively quick, okay? Everybody good with aspirin? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the, the class would be an anticoagulant, okay? The dose, baby aspirin, 324. The side effects would be excessive bleeding, ulcers, people who have uh, ulcers or digestive problems, stomach problems, can't take aspirin. Okay. Uh, it, it's really bad. Aspirin, uncoated aspirin, is really bad for the stomach. Um, it's like if you have an ulcer, taking an aspirin would set you on fire. And plus, it it causes if you're already maybe bleeding a little bit in your stomach, it's going to cause more bleeding in, in your stomach. So uh, be be cautious of that. Any wheezers? Anybody asthma? So you might have a meter dose inhaler. Okay, this would be something that you might assist. You might see it listed as you assist the patient with their meter dose inhaler. It's one thing. This is a form of a powder. The medication in it is albuterol. Okay, if you spell with phonics, it's out butter all. Out but butter all, okay? Or Ventolin, B E N. All these medications have different names. So albuterol, it's the same form, it's the same medication, different dose, but in different form. This is in a powder form, where the the nebulized mass would be in a, a liquid form. This, both the nebulized mask and the meter dose inhaler, you would help, you would have to coach the patient on administration because they're having trouble breathing, right? So they're, they're breathing rapidly and they're having trouble breathing, so they go, right? And they go, right? So they breathe it in and they blow it back out at the same rate. So if the medicine got about right here, before they blew it back out. So you have to coach them in the fact that big breath, squeeze, hold your breath, hold your breath, hold your breath. 
it's odd to have someone hold their breath that's having trouble breathing, right? So have them hold their breath, trying to get the medicine down into the bronchial, okay? Uh, and then they just, right, this little puff. So meter dose inhaler, albuterol. The class of drug for albuterol is a bronchodilator, okay? The dose, the dose on the, the uh, oh, nebulized form is 2.5 milligrams, but it comes in a tube. So you have a tube. Like so. So like those little twist drinks that you drink and uh, and uh, you have a tube. This is 2.5 milligrams in three milliliters of water, okay, or saline. And you take this entire, on a nebulized treatment, you take the whole thing and you put it in the nebulized mass and then uh, hook it to oxygen about six liters per minute and let it mist, okay, and the patient would, the route would be inhalation, all right? So uh, 2.5 milligrams, bronchodilator, side effect tachycardias, right? It's going to cause a fast heart rate because albuterol is a beta medication and it's red so it's hard to get off. It's a beta 1 and a beta 2. The beta with the little tail, beta 1 the way I remember that, one heart, beta two, two lungs, all right? So a beta one medication will affect the heart rate. A beta two medication will cause bronchodilation. This is actually a beta two agonist, okay? An agonist is what? If someone's in, if someone is in an agonist, they promote that. Right. It's opposite of what? An antagonist, right? An antagonist is against. So an agonist is a help. So a beta two agonist. The way that it produces bronchodilations, it relaxes the bronchioles. Okay. We'll learn a lot more about that when we get into respiratory emergency. But it's a beta 2, but it also has beta 1 properties, which means that it's going to speed up the heart rate. You will get a tach, the patient will get tachycardia here. I don't, I'm not a wheezer, okay? But I could take albuterol right now, open up my bronchial. I feel great because I'm getting more oxygen in, getting more air in, but my heart rate would go up. Okay, I'd get a little jittery because of the medicine, but that's about it. It's really sort of harmless in, in the fact that they, you, you can take it. It's, it's just going to make you, it's going to make you feel a little worse if you just take it and take it. Uh, because it's going to increase your heart rate, make you a little jittery, a little nausea. Okay, but it's harmless, really. Uh, so you have the beta 1, beta 2. It doesn't necessarily have any alpha properties in it. So alpha properties, there's a little symbol for it. Uh, it causes vasoconstriction. So beta one, it's gonna increase the heart rate. Beta two, it's gonna bronchodilate. If it has alpha properties in it, it's gonna vasoconstrict. Does anybody know where I'm going with this? on the next medication? Very good, epi, epinephrine, okay? It's abbreviated epi, so I don't have to spell nephrine. Huh? Epi is in the same family as albuterol. All right, so this is what I was talking about earlier. If you remember the class of drug or the family of drugs, what's the side effect of epinephrine? Uh, vasoconstriction, tachycardia, and... It's 
shut. Hi, I have something for Jamila for homecoming club. She's gone. She had enough of this. She goes, I'm out of here. I can't, yeah, I can't stand this. <laughs> she, she goes, I can't stand this class anymore. I'm out of here. It took me forever to find your class too. And now she's not here. <laughs> Don't you have Bye. a map? I couldn't find a map. They can give me one in the office. No. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. We're on GPS. <laughs> yeah. So you see these have the same same properties, right? Except epinephrine will cause vasoconstriction. These are the same. You can nebulize epinephrine. They do it all the time with pediatrics in form of racemic epinephrine. That's the that's the common drug for for pediatrics. It's racemic epinephrine. Okay. So they can you can nebulize epi. Okay. I can nebulize epinephrine right now because I'm young and I don't have a heart condition. Okay? The problem with giving epinephrine to someone, a geriatric patient, is you can induce a heart attack with it. So you, have, you do have to be careful with that. But I could, I could nebulize epinephrine now, and what would happen? You would get higher blood pressure. Right, blood pressure would go up. Uh, heart rate would go up. Heart rate would go up. Also, I'd bronchial dilate. My bronchioles would be woohoo. Yeah. What's what's today? Friday, Friday, right? So bronchial dilate. So this is sort of an easy way when you have a lot of medications to remember. You just sort of put them in that class and and go with that when when we look at these two, but. Whether it's through the meter dose inhaler or the, the nebulize, it's the same same uh, medication. All right, so do I have a nebulized mask somewhere? Yeah. You say that, but I don't see it. Oh, here it is. <laughs> so you would take your nebulizer, you'd unscrew the, you'd put it together, it comes in pieces, right? You put it together. So you go, hmm. Do that. This. <laughs> Make sure you don't squirt it on this end. <laughs> Done it. Wasted some medication. I had the, the little bowl upside down. And I squirted the medication in him like, oh, no. So threw it away, got another one, turned it right side up, put it where it belongs, okay? So you put it here. Hey, I was in a hurry. Put in that book. <laughs> put, put the medicine in there, screw on the cap, put the oxygen to six liters per minute, let it mist, do the same coaching, tell the patient to take a deep breath, hold it in there, as long as they can, then exhale, deep breath, hold it in there, let that medicine get down to the bronchioles. Okay, otherwise they're, they're just breathing it back out before it gets down to the, the bronchioles. Okay, and let it mist in there. Okay, inhalation is the route. Very quick onset, it gets down to the alveolus, right? And then across the bronchodilate. It's, it's very, very quick quick onset. Any kind of inhalation medicine is very quick. Uh, dose? 2.5 milligrams of the, the the nebulized. I'm not sure what the meter dose inhaler is. It's it's different. It's a powder form. But it's it's different. What class is it? Hmm? What class is it? A bronchodilator. The beta-2 agonist bronchodilator. Is that also the same dosage that you can say It's the same dosage. Okay. And this doesn't give a, a dose. Yeah, it's a beta-2 agonist. Hmm. Okay, so, everybody good? Oh, what's the concept? 
We have to, uh, we ain't got there yet, but our butyrol wants to be a contraindication. And so this is obviously already tachycardic. But they have a tachycardia. They have a number, usually it's like above 150, okay? If your heart rate's around 150, you can't give it. It's more of a protocol thing, but I'm cautious with people with heart rates 150. Above 150, you get them too tachycardic, it actually goes into a super ventricular tachycardia of, of, at 150, and so uh, you decrease the output so much above 150. That's the life of your filling time, right? So uh, 100's fine. They're gonna be tachycardic anyway because before they called you, they were puffing and puffing on this thing, trying to get it under control, all right? And then they can't get it under control. Little Weezer then picked up 911 and calls EMS. And then, uh, so they're already tachycardic. But then, so you have to evaluate the heart rate. On this. It's really the only huge contraindication. Of course, the allergies, all the time, right? Uh, nitro, any questions about nitroglycerin? It comes in, a, comes in a few forms. Nitro is a vasodilator, okay? It dilates the coronary artery. Didn't we just talk about this? Yeah. Did we already talk about nitro? Yeah. It's not the dose for the contraindication, but like yeah. we, we do discuss like what we do with. Okay, um, we'll, we'll do that same point in the, in the first year class. We're going over Mona. So I mean, I just just talked about this right before lunch. So I'm like, wait a minute. Okay, so uh, nitroglycerin, nitrostat comes in several different forms. It started out. <clears throat> in a spray form like this, okay? And uh, one problem with the spray form is you spray it and you go, hmm, I wonder if that actually sprayed anything. There's, a, there's sort of a question mark dot, so you, you spray form it, okay? I mean, in the beginning it started out as pill, pill form sublingual, right? Then they, oh, then they, <laughs> then they went to this spray form, okay? And you always wondered with the spray, if they, did they actually get a full dose, right? It's, it's, the route is sublingual or under the tongue, so you have the patient hold their tongue up to the roof of their mouth and spray it under their tongue. Most all the time, they're gonna stick their tongue out. You say, hold your tip of your tongue to the roof of your mouth, and they're gonna, no, roof your mouth, under your tongue. So it takes a little explanation, but you swear to go, I wonder if anything actually happened. It has sort of a nasty taste to it, sort of a bitter taste, and I haven't tasted it because it gives like a really bad headache. It's one of the side effects, but uh, I've asked patients what it tastes like, and they say, oh, it's, it's bitter. So if you do the spray, you say, did you taste it? Did you get the bitter taste? Make sure they got the spray, right? So this is one form of it here. The second form of it was a pump spray. For some reason, they got it away from aerosols and they pump spray. And it's the same. See, you, you pumped it once, but the, the first pump, there was nothing in there, so nothing was delivered. So you again, you're sort of wondering why did they really get a dose of that? If you notice in all forms, well, that's a can, but in this, it's it's in a dark bottle, and in here, it's, it's in this weird color because it's sensitive to light. That's why most patients' nitroglycerin are not as effective as ours because they put it up on their dashboard or they leave it in the light. It's also sensitive to motion. So what do you think that patient's carrying their medicine? Their purse, their, their pocket, dashboard, whatever. It says here on the bottle, 
in that one. Do not say. Right? But it's in the back of an ambulance all the time doing this. Because your nose, it's it's always moving. It's not a it's not a smooth ride. So there's always movement in the back. So if you're in the back of the ambulance doing this, you're constantly being shook up. Plus, what I find is extraordinarily funny is what's your first instinct before you give this ambulance? Shake it. Shake it. Right? It's it's like wet paint. Sometimes it's wet paint. It's one of your first instincts is to go. Oh yeah, it's wet. So it's there whether you do it or not, but shake it. So they had this and this didn't last that long. Then they went back to the pill form, which I'm glad they did. If you notice the pill form, they are very small. I'll pass one around. Oh, that would be a lot of them. They're very small. So what I do is to administer this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll give you a knife. <laughs> but uh, I'll put it in a cap and I'll sort of dump it under the patient's tongue. You can't hold it in your hand, it's too small. Okay? Uh, the other side effect, besides blood pressure, decreasing blood pressure, it gives a headache. It vasodilates almost every vessel. So it dilates the vessels in the head, which is going to produce a headache. Okay? So it's given sublingual under the tongue. The dose is 0 0.4 milligrams. And uh, it's a very quick onset. The patient should feel some relief uh, within minutes, okay? Just a few minutes. It dissolves very quickly. It still has a bitter taste to it. Uh, contraindications some of the contraindications would be and we will talk more about this as we get into cardiac emergency but a systolic blood pressure not even 100 okay typically 100 systolic the, the, the package says 80 but most of the textbooks say 100, some of them say 90, okay? But uh, 90 to 100, you can't give it, because what does it do? Lower blood pressure. Right, they're on the border of being hypotensive anyway. You know, like at 100, 102. So you have to be very careful, because like we talked about the other day, Darcy's Law, change in resistance. Drastically change. Drastic change in pressure, right? You don't want to drop this, bottom this person out, if you drop someone's blood pressure too fast, you can give them a stroke. Yeah. It drops quick. We didn't know it. I'm telling how many people we get strokes to. Okay. But uh, the other contraindication is erectile dysfunction drugs, the Viagra. Chuck, what's that other one? Thought you knew it. Right. No. Uh, <laughs> Cialis. You just didn't want to say it. The blue pill. I don't know what color Cialis is. Okay. Anyhow, uh, so you would find that out during your sample medications, right? You take this medication. Uh, if they if they take an erectile dysfunction medication, men or women. Women have the little pink pill, but that's the Viagra form, okay? Men, it's like the blue pill, right? Right, Chuck? Blue pill? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, within 28, 24 to 48 hours after, after taking that medication, they can't have nitric of any form. Uh, what it does is it causes an un... The commercial tells you this, by the way. It causes an unsafe drop in blood pressure, and what it is, it's a rebound, it's called a rebound hypotension, and uh, they can't get their blood pressure back up. 
you, you may have a very hard time, or the providers have a really hard time getting your blood pressure back up, okay? Anyway, give everybody good with that, nitroglycerin. The, the indication would be uh, cardiac-related chest pain. So if someone's having cardiac-related chest pain, you administer nitro. Uh, you can administer nitro every three, uh, every five minutes, up to three times. So every five minutes. Since it affects the blood pressure, what do you have to do every time that you administer nitro? Check the blood pressure. You check the blood pressure before giving nitro, but all the time. Make sure that they're uh, not hypotensive. And epinephrine, epi, at least our last drug, uh, it's a beta-1, beta-2, and alpha medication. Uh, we give epinephrine for allergic reactions. We give it sub-Q, subcutaneous, through an auto-injector or through a sub-Q injection. So we, we can draw it up and give it through a, a 1cc syringe. Okay. The dose is 0.3 milligrams. All right. Is that right? Yeah. So if someone's allergic to beef, peanut butter, whatever else, uh, whatever else, we can give them epinephrine. All right. So they're having this anaphylactic reaction, this allergic reaction, because what it does is it will vasodilate. I mean, vasoconstrict, okay? It, the, the vasodilation comes from the histamine release through the, uh, the allergic reaction. Allergic reaction causes this big histamine release, which causes the vasodilation, okay? So it'll reverse that. It'll increase the heart rate, but it causes vasoconstriction. It's very easy to give. Come on up here for a second, man, would you? Since you're here. It's a small needle. Attention, JV Red football players, you need to report to Portable 24 at the beginning of this period. Do not go to the field house. JV Red football players, report to Portable 24 at the beginning of this period. Do not go okay. to the field house. It's about this long, actually. And then it goes straight through the genes, okay? So to administer an auto-injector, you remove the safety cap, okay? Make sure that your thumb is not on the end. That's where the needle's coming out, okay? Stand still, don't flinch, it'll hurt, all right? And then you stab it in the thigh, hold it for 10 seconds, and then release it. And you're tough. Last, last person they tried, yeah. Last person they tried. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, very easy to administer. We we learned about sub Q injections last year, right? The oranges. Yeah. Okay, so you draw up 0.3 milligrams. So the dose is 0.3 milligrams. Uh, the indication is allergic reactions anaphylactic type reactions, okay? The contraindications, <coughs> this relevant tachycardia because we're treating a life-threatening emergency, okay. but uh, you have to be very cautious in elderly patients. You can induce a heart attack in geriatric patients with epinephrine. Okay. Otherwise, we produce epinephrine. It's a reoccurring hormone in the body. We produce it. So you can't really be allergic to it. You just have the, the side effects of it. The increased heart rate, the bronchodilation. Okay. But uh, again, we'll bring this medication back up when, when we talk about 
allergic reaction. Good? Okay. Let's let's take a break since it's break now.